Okay, uh, well, chapter 16 is a chapter that has many content, but I will, I will only focus on a few uh, points which I think are important for you to remember, how I least understand. <coughs> Uh, it's, this is mainly focused on uh, microbial evolution and systematic. Uh, what is systematic? Someone can explain what is systematic. Uh, <laughs> Classification of yeah, so, so it's, this majority of blue has been covered by our web if I look at the text we saw earlier. So, uh, the, it covers what I just say the microbial uh, is basically the, uh, the earliest form of life on Earth. So this will be the origin of cellular life. How is the origin of virus? Uh, I guess we don't want to. Uh, <laughs> That could, uh, we can see the life study at the cell, so. and some other important endosymbiotic orange of eucro, that's also a key part. Okay, Here's, uh, so how old is the planet Earth? Uh, sorry, what? <laughs> Uh, I remember it. <laughs> okay, uh, four point six is you probably are also right. <coughs> uh, first afternoon of micro microbial life can be found in rocks. How many years? That's close. <laughs> well, basically, uh, the Earth is uh, about 5 million, 4.5, almost 0.5. It's, it's less than 10% of the time after the Earth form, you can see life on Earth. It's actually very quick. It is a very rapid uh, process. Okay, uh, why, how do we make that solution? That is because there's uh, what evidence we know life on Earth started almost like a three, four, mi four billion years ago, 3.8 billion years ago. What's, uh, what's the evidence? Those will be the falsified microbial mass on ocean floor, those things, or in rocks. Um, that's called. It started with the S. I heard the word. Uh, no. Well, no. Sedimentation is caused by microbial. You you will see iron sedimentation. That's actually very close. Uh, except it's called different. Uh, is this dramatic? <laughs> if you go to a natural history museum, you probably see that. Uh, it, it occurred twice on this side, so I close on it. Uh, this is how it looks like. It's, it does look like sedimentation in the rock. Uh, so that say the so you don't look at the stromatolite, like you say those are ancient because it can also form in very close uh, from very recent form. So just because you see a stromatolite like doesn't mean it's an ancient. <coughs> Okay, uh, when, when planet Earth was first formed, well, it has no oxygen, is it hotter or cooler than present day? Hotter. Much hotter. <laughs> yeah, it is much hotter. Volcanoes, there's no ozone layer since the Nazi, no ozone layer. <coughs> the sun radiation will directly uh, hit the Earth's surface. This basically no life can exist right, on those conditions. So we can pretty much conclude <coughs> life has to come from those um, non-life things, abiotic systems. So basically, 
life has to come out uh, from uh, those abiotic elements. This is actually basically what the best model we have about how life origin on Earth. Uh, some of you who actually, both of you are senior, you, you should at least explain some of the key elements here. So, what's the key message here? Before DNA, what is that? Um, what, what is that? What, what is this? Why? So, so what, is, what, what does this sequence mean? RNA, RNA, it's DNA? It's evolution, like evolutionary in it. Which, which means, our best argument is, like, how did life start? It? The major macromolecule is uh, RNA, DNA, protein. So how, how do they occur at the same time? Okay. No. No. So, but the first one is RNA. So, so our best model is uh, think RNA form first, and then protein, and then DNA. If you think about that, the RNA has to replicate by itself, but then. RNA also has to be enzyme to synthesize the protein, and then the protein be used to synthesize DNA. If all those molecules are ready, they will be the first uh, cellular line. What is LUCA? -L that will be. Yeah, I heard the word last. Yes. <coughs> U will be. L is for last. The U is. is okay. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> Yes, uh, I, I Google L-U-C-A, it's actually also a, a Greek word or something. <laughs> L-U-C-A, it's our last universal common ancestor. So basically this one gave rise to bacteria and archaea. So, so we believe life starts from this and gave to archaea. And, uh, so what's missing in this picture is, yeah, how, how does the carry arise? Yes. Yeah. So you had to uh, turn oxygen 
No, uh, it had to have carbon from CO2 and <laughs> upturn up energy, not from uh, uh, organic compound oxi and oxide. It had to come from other things. Uh, like that. People, we, we now think that hydrogen is mainly the energy source in the early days. Bacteria and algae diverge two, three, or four million years ago. Uh, take an average, I guess. Four billion years when the life actually started. Actually, uh, it's, it is four, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I remember the wrong. <laughs> Oh wow! So that's actually even amazing, and that means uh, I that means the, the RNA life started almost immediately after this. Since this is already four billion, this could to uh, it's almost so basically as soon as Earth arrived, the life probably started to. Uh, I always found some I don't know, something else to go with the slides myself. <laughs> uh, Yes, so I, I guess uh, they just, just say the, there will be distinct metabolism and uh, some people argue uh, bacteria and archaea merge the metabolism. That's one of the theory for how you crowd the uh, uh, Here's a another. Uh, how, how did the oxygen come from the you know, <laughs> uh, cyanobacteria is basically the responsible for producing the oxygen we are breathing now. Uh, ah, this probably answer or at least address the question we, we just talked about. How did the eukaryo come from? Uh, <coughs> The textbook says there are two, two major hypotheses uh, we now think of. One is on the left, I think. We gradually, gra the, the, somehow along the line of archaea, nucleus start to form and then eukaryotes start to form. Then the eukaryotes, uh, this kind of eukaryotes acquire mitochondria and the chloroplast. <coughs> and then there is I think uh, they just probably can explain the one on the right. <laughs> based on based on based on what uh, he has heard, probably can some more insight on it. Uh, so what does the one on the right mean, argues? Right. Well, what I can't engulf the. Uh, tinch flower, right? Yeah, this oh, well, it actually says right here. I think. So it, it says uh, archaea and bacteria have different metabolism. So the archaea consumes uh, hydrogen, but some bacteria can produce hydrogen. So somehow archaea engulfed uh, hydrogen producing bacteria, and that become early mitochondria. And this, endos this will be an endosymbiotic event since one basically eat another one inside. Uh, then it goes. So how actually how do you test these two models? I mean you have these two models. How are you going to test these two models? Yeah how do we, uh, how do we how do we find out which model is more correct or Well, you look at the cell, all you can see is mitochondria and the genome. <laughs> right. how, do you, how do you know what happened? So all you look at the cell is basically at the very end. How do you know what happened? That's probably a... Uh, well, we're giving it all one time. I forgot that. I guess it's that kind of thing. That's what we're giving us here. Yeah. How, do you, how do you know that? So, yeah, how do we, uh, 
to be honest, this model came out about 10 years ago while I was doing graduate school. So at the time, uh, people just laugh at it. And so, but apparently now we think this model is so correct we can't put it in the textbook. <laughs> so uh, the the person who proposed it is a very uh, is a, is a, has a lot of character. I actually met him at the Olympic conference. And he's actually the American lady in Germany. He came in late. He came in in a police squad car with two bottles of wine. He said he came out. <laughs> and he said he bought it because of duty free at the airport. And he flies late, so why not drink so? <laughs> that's, that's a person who, who pr proposed this model. <laughs> So I mean, when he, when he, when I, I, when I first heard him, I, I just looked around and people just laughing. <laughs> people saw this interesting, but don't take it very serious. But apparently, it's not in your textbook. <laughs> yeah, how could he test this? You have to study the molecular evolution and look at the genome. So basically compare the genome architecture between the bacteria, archaea, eukarya, look at how mitochondrial genes uh, distributed between bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And so uh, Yeah, this one will be one directly into the eukarya. So basically, if you look at the, the if you trace the trace the original copy, the ancient copy of the mitochondrial genomes, and it will, it will become a horizontal transfer from this to this. Right. So this one you can trace, say there's a hydrogen consuming arc here, you, you trace all those uh, uh, genes, and you will find they are more associated with hydrogen producing bacteria, and they are, uh, I guess the argument, they will be in in the the more more closely derived will be have more partition, but the later derived will most of the mitochondrial gene will be more in the nuclear gene. So it's, uh, apparently the tendency is the mitochondrial genome is originally there will be two copies of genome, and since mitochondria become become a parasite in another cell, it's going to lose a lot of essential gene which is already in the so it's basically to see how the mitochondrial genome degree over time. So that's that's a way you can you can make some argument about it. So it's basically based on a, a bioinformatics and molecular evolution data to, to make this argument. Not say that you also those data itself doesn't tell function. You also have to study the biochemical property of different cells and come up with that. Uh, that's basically the uh, I guess the implication of the micro study all all this uh, microbial evolution, but basically the theoretical aspect of the universal tree of life. Uh, in fact, I spent uh, two years studying the universal tree of life, uh, uh, but I studied using a protein fraction data, not the uh, Metabolic data. So, so the, <coughs> uh, we we actually already uh, talk about this tree, and uh, the the official word of this tree is actually says phylogeny. So it basically is a tree tree like uh, structure to describe the connection. A temporal <coughs> connection between different organisms. Uh, although it says evolution and history, but that is often inferred. It's not given. I give you the data doesn't mean it tells you which one is the older one, which one is the newer one. You have to use some external knowledge to infer which one comes from which. <coughs> There are some genes can be used to infer evolution for majority of species. Um, 
many of those genes also following something called molecular clock. That's because the uh, evolution is mainly driven by the mutation. Mutation is a very slow process. And over time, it almost looks like there is a constant mutation clock. So if you use that molecule, you can, you can calculate the fact when the, when the diversification occurs. So that's how we, if you base on molecular insurance data, you can infer how uh, these two species diverged, say, 400 million years ago, 800 million. So that's how we calculate this. So for bacteria, that would be this. Actually, not just for bacteria, for eukaryotes as well. A small subunit RNA is the 16S uh, for microbial, but it is 18S in neutrons. For yeast, that would be 18 Okay, uh, The person who first proposed this is Carl Woods. <coughs> In fact, uh, we now say they are bacteria and archaea. Uh, but before Carl Woods, this is probably happening in the 1980s. Before many, many of you probably are born. <laughs> when, when were you born, most likely? Maybe that was always. <laughs> but Carl Woods actually uh, first used small subunit RNA. And when he generated a tree for, at that time, we think bacteria and archaea, they are all in one group. And he did a tree which put archaea as a separate group, and he thought he made a mistake. He just doesn't know how to generate a phylogeny. But, so for a very long time, uh, when he published this kind of results, say archaea should be a separate domain. And people just laugh at him, no, take him seriously. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> in fact, uh, I, I don't even remember when it was his first paper published. It's almost for for even even in the early nineties, people don't take him seriously. But now it's written in a textbook. I can't why kind of I say we do my own life. I'm back to it again. So okay. <coughs> um, uh, well, in his days, he had to have to go to various uh, places uh, to, to isolate the bacteria and archaea. But nowadays, we can <laughs> we can sit here, look at the computer, and still get it. <laughs> but we can just do a what what do we call a sequence of similarity search, and there is a very good tool called BLAST. It's called Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. I think people first come out the blast first and then come out with <laughs> description. <laughs> That's whatever what I saw a word like that. So perfect <laughs> acronym. I think they come out the blast and then figure out this one. <laughs> uh, so basically, this is a tool uh, people now use to search for sequence. If you want to study how, let's say you isolate a new bacteria, you want to see, well, you isolate new micro from the soil. You want to see this bacteria, archaea, or eukaryote. You just sequence a small subunit DNA to a blast. That will tell you. In fact, you probably tell you not just to which domain, all the way to the genus. You can all the way to. It. It's actually very hard to tell the species of bacteria, but the genus you can easily tell based on the small subunit RNA. <coughs> Okay, so yeah, the phylogenetic tree is probably a, one of the key concepts I think you should absolutely know, and you also have to uh, should also know how to interpret. It. Here's uh, some phylogenetic trees. There are, in general, there are two kind of trees. One is called unruly, and the other one called ruddy. Technically speaking. When you use a sequence alignment, generate a, a tree, those trees are all unrooted trees. The program will not tell you, and there's no software to tell you what's the root of your tree. You know the root of a tree because you have expert knowledge, because you have something else to tell what's the root of the tree. What the, tech, what the technology of software can tell you is just how similar 
those sequence are related to each other and then generate that tree to describe the similarity or dissimilarity among the entire group. So every, every software will generate this unrooted tree. If you want to root it, give a node which is the ancient, the, the, how the species evolved, you have to tell the software how to do it. So, so you have to use some expert knowledge to tell that's the case. Uh, if you look at this tree, uh, one, two, three here, that's each, each one is called a leaf. <coughs> Those will be branches, just like a tree. Those will be the leaves, that's the branches. And uh, this is one, two, three. Is this two tree describe the same thing? This unrooted and this unrooted. Yeah. Do, do, do they, are these two tree actually are the same? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, this one just rooted, right? If the, where, where is this root on, on this side? Is it here? The end of one. No. Here. Yeah. Is it here? Is that, is that the end of one? Is that the one? Uh, you, you can yes. make so, so here's the root, like right? That. So you have one, two, three on one side, and four and five on the other side. <laughs> You have one, two, three on this side, and four and five on the other side. So the root is here. Oh, yeah. uh, we, we all see this. Mm -hmm. uh, the other way is basically you can join on the board. You have a, and you can basically picture the tree as a, as a plastic <coughs> bubble. So you can just uh, prove them and reshape them. So so. So this is three, two, three, one, and uh, five, five. So this is the original tree. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I, if I, if this is rubber band, I pull, I pull it here. I pull it toward the bottom. Mm -hmm. So I gradually pull, pull it like this, right? and then I put this to the top. So this will be. And then I also pull this side to the top. So basically, if I flipped over, that would be that tree. So uh, if I, f if this is five and four, is that also the same tree? Yes. No. Yes. Who say no? say yes. Yeah, they actually the, the same tree. They describe the same same relationship. If I if I flip the, the entire thing, let's say if I put the one here, not the same tree. It's also the same tree. But if I switch this, <coughs> it is the same tree. And this this time it's not since uh, because uh, in that tree, two and three is one bifurcating pattern. So in this case, one and two, so it actually changed the relationship of the genes. So, yeah, so this one, uh, this is just a different presentation. In fact, this presentation is used for to infer how the branching occurred using molecular clock. Usually when we try to infer by molecular clock, we will put it this way. But if the tree put it this way, the evolution time is only counted as the horizontal branches. Those vertical branches doesn't count for anything. It's just used for presentation. So the if the tree put it this way, the time will be this uh, y, uh, x axis. So time basically goes from here to to the right. And the vertical one is just used for presentation. Okay. 
and okay, so this will be a kind of a this is basically a rooted universal tree of life. Bacteria, archaea, eukarya. The last common last universal common ancestor is here. So and then you actually can see uh, the, the, the root of this tree calculated by software is actually here. But we actually think life started here. So that's the, clearly the difference between what the software tell you and what our own view of how life occurred. So we didn't interpret this tree literally. We actually put some extra information here. We, we think life started not from this this root, but from here. Since if you think about the volcano vent back a few slides ago, when life start occurred, it generally goes back back to and out here. So you can uh, cannot start here. Right? So it started here, and then the arc goes this way <coughs> up here. Take. Of bacteria as a mitochondria, actually published somewhere here, and then eukaryote evolved uh, after endosymbiosis. Yeah. All right. <coughs> it's it's actually very difficult to say which bacteria is different species, which one is not. It is because. Uh, who knows why, why it's difficult to tell bacteria are the same species or not. It's because how, how do we tell lions and, uh, and uh, monkeys are different species? Mm -hmm. Sorry, what? Um, first of all. Sorry, I didn't catch it. I said, for one, that's um, just, physical characteristics is actually one of the worst criteria for these five species. There are, there are some species, the male and the female, have so drastic morphology. <laughs> they are the same species, but it can still have drastic different morphology, especially under different conditions. How, how, how do we know, say, cat and the wolf are different species, or dogs? Different genes. What? No, I was talking about um, different. They have different genes. No. Well, ultimately, yes, it's because they have different genes. But how? How? What's the practical criteria we use this? Procreation. Start to getting closer to that. Procreation. What? Procreation. Like they could reproduce. Yes. Yes. Exactly. If if who? Two group of uh, can reproduce and have a the key is have a viable next generation. The next generation also can reproduce. If uh, I forgot that like, uh, horse and uh, the horse and donkey right, right. horse and donkey are produced mule given mule, but mule is sterile. So that's clearly even though they reproduce by still they are different species. Uh, that's, in fact, the lion and tiger can also reproduce, but the, the next generation is also has a problem to reproduce. Okay. So it, you, you have to have a viable generation. But the trouble is bacteria doesn't have that kind of lifestyle. <laughs> so, uh, so that definition, that's, that's called biological definition of a species, doesn't work well in bacteria. So we need a different definition of bacteria. Nobody agree on a new definition. So it's hard to to define the species in bacteria. All all other single cell organisms, even for yeast, it's hard to define. Yeast is also a single cell uh, organism. Even though it's in care, it's still difficult because uh, yeast can easily cross with other group of yeast. Sometimes it's actually have a fertile next generation sometimes doesn't, so it's, yeah, it's also a controversial. Okay, uh, uh, this is actually people uh, provide a possible way how uh, different like, microbial can give a new species, and basically this also explains 
what the definition of species. <coughs> so ultimately, it is argued each species had to correspond to an ecological niche adapted. It has to adapt to a different ecological niche. So I'm, I'm just going to skip this. <coughs> Uh, in fact, uh, the the key uh, is uh, in uh, philosophically. I guess uh, you can, you can if you really want to design a universal species concept, people can say you can argue this called vertical gene flow. And in human, the gene flow is not vertical. You, we don't inherit a hundred percent of <coughs> our parents. It's actually recombined. The two, two parents will exchange genetic information and pass up on them. For bacteria, it's, it's asexual, majority is asexual reproduction, so this will be a completely vertical, 100% inherent as far as parents. Uh, <coughs> now, the key thing is. Uh, but sometimes uh, it, we, we actually did the, the remember way back we also have a, the F plasmid bacteria can also exchange some other information it can, we can also transform the DNA into it. so in this situation you can also have some uh, exchange of genetic information if it if this exchange are readily available I guess we can also say that's in the same species not say sometimes it can be so drastic, uh, it can occur very, very far away. So it, it can be, this line can be really blurred sometimes. Okay, uh, I guess I, I'm, I'm wandering to a gray area. <laughs> Probably gave you too much information. Okay. Uh, how many prokaryotic species do we think we have on this planet? Uh, at one time, I had a conversation with some people feel very excited. Yes, we found a new species and something. Uh, the, in fact, they are, we only know, I think we, we know about 10% of species on it. But for bacteria, we probably know, know less than one out of a thousand species. Uh, in fact, we, we now have this, uh, we don't have to, there, there are so many bacteria we cannot isolate, we can, but we can sequence the DNA just in one drop of water. Uh, uh, I, I recently visited a, a microbiology lab and they sequence one gram of soil. So guess how many, not species, how many different genes they can find in that one gram of soil? Is that hundreds, thousands? Uh, 10,000, 100,000, uh, 1 million. What, which number do we, do we guess? 10,000. What? 10,000. 10,000? It's actually millions. In one crowd, <laughs> it's actually millions of a new sequences we never know. So, 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 but ironically, if you look at the gene bank, we only have like 7,000 species of bacterial species. <laughs> reality there are probably several order of the magnitude of all the bacteria we never haven't even studied. <laughs> so uh, in fact I recently uh, took some soil sample from the field trip in the Heredi Mountain. I asked uh, two, two, of, two of you I put on a plate. Uh, I we put on how many plate? Twenty plate? Two of the two of the plate have nothing grow on. And I, I took the soil sample, water sample, <laughs> it's, it's, to me it's unbelievable, I took some soil sample, can have no bacteria, <laughs> it's, just, it's just nothing can grow on the plate I use, but there must be tons of things on there, just cannot be cultured. <laughs> yeah. Okay, anyhow, uh, here's a summary of the, of the key information. So, the, the, when, when I think about the, from the macro molecule, the first molecule is RNA. Uh, how endosymb oh, actually, uh, endosymbiosis are in origin of eukaryotes, I guess. Uh, but that's basically the hydrogen hypothesis. Uh, hydrogen consuming archaea 
uh, engulf a hydrogen producing bacteria which leads to the endosymbiosis that's the origin of eukaryote we can use small uh, subunit, subunit of ribosomal RNA as a molecule to type most of the species most of the cellular species, viruses um, so that's gave the universal tree of life um, I guess you should know something about <coughs> the species okay, let me stop this one